Genesis 1 to 11 is history. It is talking about things that actually happened in space and time. Hyperbole is not in conflict with the doctrine of inerrancy. I think that the flood story also uses figurative language to describe a historical reality in order to make important theological points. Hey everyone, this is what your pastor didn't tell you today. I'm, today I'm on with Trimper Longman the Third. We're gonna be talking about Noah's flood. Is it local, historical? Trimper, how are you doing today? And uh, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Zach. Good to be with you. Um, yeah, I'm Trimper Longman. Um, uh, well, my title is now Distinguished Scholar and Professor Emeritus at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. Um, I've been a long time professor of Old Testament studies for 40 plus years. I know I look younger than I am. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so have a wonderful wife, Alice, three sons and eight grandchildren. And uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Awesome. And now uh, you have your PhD in ancient Near Eastern studies. Where's that from? Uh, Yale University, Yale uh, University yeah. in in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's where I, yeah I have that's where it's from. Was that was that any different than uh you know considering it's a it's a big college, one of the Ivy League schools and all that? It is an Ivy League school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so our main rival is Harvard, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, yeah, so something I like about you is that you take the Bible seriously, you believe it's true, you believe God communicated something to us, and mm -hmm. so so for you, really, the only issue is how to interpret it, and that's what I like about you. So that's why we're here today. Um, so can you talk about, you know, the most popular views on the flood, whether it's local, global, or in between, and, yeah. um, and you know, what, what the different views are on that? Sure. So... I mean, the debate is usually presented as a debate between a worldwide flood and a local flood, uh, with some variations in each case. Um, and so people debate whether the biblical text itself is describing some kind of massive local flood or one that covers the whole world. And, and of course, back when Genesis was written, they didn't have the same conception that we have of the world as a whole. But, um, but yeah, but that's, that's basically the, the main contour. Some people think there's a interesting view that uh, I think is has some arguments in favor of it, which is the idea of the um, flood was regional, but it appeared to be worldwide to those who went through it, and therefore it's described as a global flood. But that's not my view. <laughs> Neither of those actually describe the view that John Walton and I hold in our book, Lost World of the Flood. Gotcha. And what about historical and myth? Yeah. So often Genesis debates surrounding Genesis 1 to 11, which of course includes the creation accounts, uh, is, is it myth or is it history? And it's, that's, a, that's a sort of false dichotomy, in my opinion. Uh, I would say this, that if you pay close attention to reading Genesis 1 to 11, in its original setting, which is important to do, what you should conclude is that Genesis 1 to 11 is history indeed. It is talking about things that actually happened in space and time, but it's those uh, things are being described using figurative language. So if you think about the creation account, it's in Genesis 1 described as happening over six days with the seventh day of rest. Um, 
But as early theologians like Origen and Augustine pointed out, these aren't literal 24 hour days. It's a figurative depiction of creation as happening over a regular work week. Uh, and the main thing that they point to to indicate that is there's not even a sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day. So how can you have evenings and mornings for the first three days? Literally historical evenings and mornings. Because you need a you need a sun, moon, and stars to have evenings and mornings. So in your book, you talk about the text of Genesis and it's, as it's, it's an ancient document. Can you right. talk about why that's significant? Why we can't look at it as, as you know, our 21st century lunches of the text? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my co-author in that Lost World of the Flood book, John Walton, puts it very well when he says the Old Testament was not the Bi the books of the Bible, Old and New Testament, weren't written to us. They weren't written to us. They were written to an ancient contemporary audience. They were written for us, for sure. They have implications for us. But, I mean, just think about it. Um, they don't call the book of Romans, Romans for nothing, right? Because the book of Romans is a book that was written to the church in Rome and addressing issues that they had in Rome at that time. So what that means for us as interpreters of the Bible, that we need to <clears throat> read these books and understand that they were written in a way that were perfectly understandable to their contemporary audience, but that we might have to do a little bit of work to apply and understand, you know, to put ourselves back in that ancient context before applying it to our own present context. I mean, it's really kind of obvious when you remember that the Old Testament is written predominantly in Hebrew with a little bit of Aramaic and the New Testament is written in Greek. It's not written in some kind of immediately accessible language to all people today. You have to uh, translate the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek uh, before we read it. And as somebody, I'm a senior translator. I'm one of the six senior translators of the New Living Translation. And to produce the New Living Translation, <clears throat> we needed to make tens of thousands of interpretive decisions. So, um, <clears throat> and that's true of every translation uh, that takes place. So, so, and when we did that, we wanted to put it in a contemporary language, but we had to, first of all, understanding it, understand it in its ancient context. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so off the cuff question. So yeah, when, um, you know, obviously, you're going to have some people that say, OK, you know, the text of Genesis or maybe the bi entire Bible as a whole, you know, it, it's God inspired, God breathed. Why shouldn't we look at you know, specifically the story of, you know, the flood or the creation accounts? Why shouldn't we look at it from the perspective of God? Like, you know, maybe God seeing the entire globe or. Yeah. Uh, from, yeah. From, you know, from God's perspective, not like, you know, a, a man <laughs> on Earth that doesn't understand like all different aspects of science. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think that God is using human beings to communicate his message to people. Um, it's not as if those human beings are um, kind of their minds are taken over by God and they're writing things that they uh, don't understand. I mean, I think one of the things we need to remember is that uh, the Bible is a revelation of God. It's teaching us about God and our relationship with him. It's not interested in teaching us, say, cosmology. Um, and so the cosmology 
the view of the universe that we read in the Old Testament is an ancient Near Eastern uh, perspective on cosmology and not a, you know, um, a 21st century perspective on the nature of the cosmos. So I've had this discussion actually with people like you, Ross, Reasons to Believe, uh, people who read modern science back into the Bible as if the Bible is, um, is aware of, say, what physicists today apparently believe are the <clears throat> 11 dimensions rather than the three dimensions of reality. And it's kind of like, yeah, no, um, the Bible's not interested. It's not a science textbook. It's talking about theology and it's, um, it's talking about it within the context of ancient understandings of the world. So basically you're saying that when we look at the text, it looks exactly like an ancient Near Eastern Israelite would write it compared to someone today, how they would write it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> gotcha. Okay. Now tell us about your views of history and myth. Like, um, I mean, you kind of talked about like the different views on that, but like, what do you think the text of the flood is? Is it, is it some parts of it made up or all of it completely true or how does that work? <laughs> It's all true in what it intends to teach us, um, <clears throat> which, um, but it, I, I guess, again, I'll return to my characterization of Genesis 1 to 11 as history, for sure, talking about things that actually happened, but doing so you, in a fa using figurative language. Um, Again, going back to the creation, Genesis 2, 7, when it describes God as picking up some dust and blowing on it, you know, that's obviously figurative language. I mean, God is a spirit, and so he doesn't have lungs. Um, and there's an interesting further dimension to that in that it uh, kind of, critiques ancient Near Eastern ideas of the creation of humanity, where the Babylonians and most likely the Canaanites, uh, the, the, but the Babylonians definitely talked about the creation of the first human beings as from the dust of, of the clay of the ground and the blood of a demon god into which all the gods spit. So you see that these figurative depictions are trying to teach us something about humanity's relationship with God and the Babylonian figurative depiction is saying, you know what, human beings, they were evil from get-go. They were created from demon blood. <laughs> uh, whereas the uh, biblical account says, no, they were created from the breath of God. That's a very dignified perspective on humanity, uh, which comports with the biblical teaching that humans uh, at the beginning of their creation were morally innocent. And unlike the Babylonian Canaanite perspective, which is humans were wicked from the start, they were made from demon blood. Um, the biblical account is saying no, uh, humans, as created by God, are um, morally innocent. And the reason why there's sin and evil in the world, and because God created us that way, but because uh, humans rebelled against God. And so I think that the flood story um, also uses figurative language to describe a historical reality in order to make important theological um, points. Gotcha. Okay, so on page 30 of your, you and Walton's book, now tell me who, who wrote this, whether it was you or Walton. Uh, 
It says, there are clear signals that the writing, while referential, is not particularly interested in reporting the event in a way that allows us to reconstruct the event, but rather focuses on the interpretation of the event. In other words, the author depicts the event in a way that furthers his theological message. Can you talk about what you mean by that? I mean, are you saying that there are parts that are, <coughs> you know, maybe they're using hyperbole, but it's yeah. literally made up? Or like, how does that work? Uh, literally made up is uh, kind of a pejorative way of putting it. Uh, hyperbole uh, is a legitimate rhetorical figurative way to communicate truth. You know, I think, <clears throat> I, by the way, I don't know who wrote that, but we both agree with it. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and, um, and so, for instance, and I, I think I may use this example in the book. Uh, I will sometimes talk about how when my wife and I travel, uh, you know, my wife might pick up my suitcase and say, your suitcase weighs a ton. And I'm going, I mean, my response is, honey, are you kidding? It doesn't weigh, it doesn't weigh 2,200 pounds. But I know what she means. She means it's heavy. And uh, then I, so I respond, yeah, honey, you know that I carry a lot of books in my suitcase. <laughs> so, um, so, so hyperbole is not misleading, okay? Um, it is utilized for rhetorical purposes, for emphasis, et cetera. So, and it's interesting <clears throat> that, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy from the 1970s, but <laughs> in that statement, it very clearly states that hyperbole is not in conflict with the doctrine of inerrancy. Um, and, and that's good because there's actually considerable amount of hyperbole <laughs> in the bible gotcha now so let's kind of dig into this so i mean you say you can't reconstruct it but surely we can if you're going to say that it's true we can reconstruct some of it right like, yeah well i say that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what were you gonna say well i was gonna say i think what uh what we mean there is that we cannot be dogmatic in terms of talking, say, about where it happened, um, how large a flood it was, um, the date of this flood. Um, and <clears throat> But what we do mean is there is a real historical, uh, devastating, we think, regional flood that's behind the <clears throat> text of Genesis 6 to 9 that is being described as a worldwide flood um, for in a hyperbolic way in order to make theological, in order to communicate important theological ideas. And so, um, and I, I f remember we forwarded the idea in this book that um, that it may be connected with a flood like the one that happened about 7,000 years ago after the last ice age, which was a devastating, massive flood in the Eastern Mediterranean region that probably so imprinted itself on the minds of the people who survived it, that they began passing down the tradition of this flood. <clears throat> so the flood, as I say, um, because of present political military um, situation, most of us probably know the Black Sea, which, uh, <clears throat> but the Black Sea did not exist as a sea 7,000 years ago. Uh, it was a lake, and um, 
it became a sea connected to the Mediterranean, as I say, when the last uh, ice age ended and the melted waters caused the waters of the Mediterranean to flow into the Black Sea, at Black, into the what is now the Black Sea. And uh, archaeologists have definitively proved that this is the case by discovering the former coastline of the uh, of this body of water before it became a sea. So it's we talk about this in the book, of course. So um, so something like that. It may not have been that, but it was something like that that we believe um, <clears throat> uh, helped the biblical author. Uh, who we believe is inspired by God uh, to um, write the account of the flood. Gotcha. Now, that's going to make some interesting questions because obviously, you know, if you think Noah and his family is a real person, a historical person, or correct me if I'm wrong, but if, and if you're saying that, you know, that's a potential, or you said like, but I would assume that also means you think that's a potential um, you know, what happened 7,000 years ago is a potential uh, background for this flood. Are you saying that it's possible that someone like Noah was on a boat in, on, in that flood area region event? Yeah, I mean, that's possible, but I don't think it's necessary to the truthfulness of the account. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting that the Babylonians have a very similar story to Genesis 6 to 9. And <clears throat> I, what I would say is that the historical event, which lies behind the flood story, uh, is being told by the, um, is being, uh, being passed down in what I would call the godly line that, of course, leads to Israel and the ungodly line, which is the Babylonian account. Okay, interesting. So um, so would you say that uh, the, the text of, you know, the flood was like, you know, that's, that's the, the real thing that happened and the rest of them were fake or yes. kind of like? The story changed, or do you have a, well, a hypothesis? Yeah, what I would say is that the biblical account is interpreting the flood story in an accurate way in relationship to the true God who exists, Yahweh, over against the Babylonian account, which is perverting the story in its idolatrous, polytheistic uh religious perspective interesting okay so let's continue yeah um so so you've talked in the past about how there's a bunch of different uses of figurative language and um you know that's how that's why you'd say that you know there's it's um you know it's portraying a global flood but it's it, you know it was it's actually a local event yeah um can you talk about like what you, the best reasons there are to think that compared to thinking like it you know it's actually a global event that occurred yeah sure i mean this raises the issue of the relationship between the bible and science right so um so um if there were a global flood as I've talked to many Christian geologists, you would have definitive evidence of a global flood. And as it turns out, there's none. And so um, you either have to question science and consensus science or you have to conclude that there wasn't a global flood. So bottom line, um, there's no evidence that there was a global flood and you would expect that there would be if there were. So uh, this raises the question 
of the relationship between science and the Bible and uh, classical Protestant theology. Well, I'll also include Catholicism in a minute, um, has argued as represented. Interesting. Not the response I expected. Okay, so, <laughs> so I mean, you're essentially saying that, like, I mean, to break it down, you're essentially saying, yeah, so we have pretty, really, really good evidence that there was no global flood. So when we go to the text of what we think the Bible is true and inspired, that yeah. we can't be talking about a global flood. Is that, is that it? Well, I mean, I would add this. <clears throat> First of all, that there's not evidence that there wasn't. It's the lack of evidence that there was and where we would expect to have evidence. And then secondly, um, we a, a attentive reader of Genesis 1 to 11 would already have recognized that there's a lot of figurative language in Genesis 1 to 11, um, which is something that was recognized, as I said, way back in the early church by people like Augustine and Origen. They said, these are not solar days. Um, Origen said, who would be so foolish as to think that the days of Genesis 1 are literal days when there's not even a sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day. Um, <clears throat> so there are all kinds of signals within the text itself that this is not a literal description of how God created creation. It's proclaiming loudly that God created everything, including us, but... <clears throat> not um, making any comment about how he created us. And then we carry that forward to the flood story. And <clears throat> because Genesis to 1 to 11 is a unit in and of itself. It's what we often call the primeval history, <clears throat> which is really a prequel to the important story of the call of Abraham. And when you get to Abraham, um, then there's more attention to actual description of what happened in space and time. Genesis 1 to 11 is in continuity with Genesis 12 and following in that it's talking about things that actually happen. But Genesis 1 to 11 is covering a vast period of time. It has a global focus as opposed to when you come to Genesis 12, all of a sudden the narrative focuses in on Abraham and follows his life um, starting at the age of 75, right? So there are like uh, 12, 13 chapters dedicated to about 50 years, Genesis 12 through Genesis 26, whereas Genesis 1 to 11 started way back at creation and takes us up to the time of Abraham. So, of course, the narrative is going to work in a different way to communicate uh, that period of time. It's, it's really <clears throat> um, the focus of Genesis is on the call of Abraham and the promise. And Genesis 1 to 11 is kind of like giving background information to help us understand why it is that God called Abraham in this way. And within the Torah as a whole, uh, the book of Genesis is really kind of a prequel to the important story, which is the story of the Exodus. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think, um, I think, that helps explain why Genesis 1 to 11 has the distinctive features that it does. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, in the book you mentioned that there are, well, actually, I mean, you just mentioned that, you know, Genesis 1, that, you know, a lot of it, or even the whole thing, is, um, you know, very hyperbolic, or not hyperbolic, but figurative. Figurative, right. Um, you mentioned uh, Genesis 2-7 regards to Adam, you know, God breathing <clears throat> into Adam's nostrils and all that. Um, 
what other aspects of you know you know two to four two to five mention are uh, fig use figurative language that you yeah. Can think of? yeah so i mean in two i've already mentioned the picture of uh, god create um, creating the first uh man from the dust of the ground his breath but think of the creation of the woman from the side or rib of the man, um, which is a figurative depiction of the creation of the woman that's emphasizing equality, mutuality uh, between the man and the woman, um, not from her head, not from his head or from his feet, but from her, from his side. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so, I mean, and then I think the, the picture in Genesis three, which is describing a historical reality. I want to emphasize that, that, um, that human beings, uh, by which I mean human beings who have been endowed with the status of being image bearers, not the first homo sapiens, but, um, and I talk about this in my book. Confronting Old Testament Controversies, Evolution, Divine Violence, Sexuality, and History, um, <clears throat> that, um, that Genesis 3 is talking about a real historical event. Those who have been granted the status of being image bearers are um, rebel against God. And so death, in the human experience and sin uh, find their origin in human rebellion. But are we to think that there actually was a walking serpent who talked, a uh, tree that uh, whose fruit they uh, was forbidden and they ate from? I don't think that that is a literal depiction of a historical event, but rather a figurative description of a historical event. Interesting. Okay. So, and you also mentioned anachronisms. Yeah. And um, yeah. I want to mention a few. So domesticated animals, construction of a first city, musical instruments, a bronze and iron making. Can you talk about um, like one, like what is an acronym? Why is that important? And like, um, what is the text trying to tell us with these anachronisms? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, an anachronism is describing an event um, using, you know, uh, well, that, that's a good question. I coming uh, having a hard time coming up with a simple, brief description, but uh, so I'll just illustrate it. It's an anachronism to think that iron making, which we know happened in 1200 BC, that's when iron was invented, is then retroverted to a much earlier time period. So. It's describing a much earlier time period using descriptions that happened much later than that time period. So uh, Genesis uh, 4 also talks about Cain, Cain's son uh, building the first city. Well, the first city we know was built in the fourth, century, fourth millennium BC, sometime in the 3000s. Um, we also know that, um, the creation took place a long time before that. So what is it trying to tell us? It's trying to tell us, um, as it associates various technologies, building cities, music, iron making, domesticated animals, that, technologies are 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 problematic are are dangerous that they might have an evil side to them so it's associating technology 
with um, with the Cainite genealogy as a way of saying not. I don't think it's saying that cities, for instance, are inherently evil and we need to move to countryside or um, that making metal is uh, problematic, though, of course, iron was utilized primarily at first in the making of weapons. Um, so. I think what it's saying is beware of the dark side of technology, <laughs> which, yeah, of course, resonates today, right, uh, Zach? I mean, we think about um, we think about you know internet, computer technology. Uh, I hope that we're using it tonight in a redemptive way by having this discussion. But there's a dark side to the internet as well. Um, so I think the message of Genesis 4 is very important and contemporary and relevant and true. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so that brings another interesting question then. So if the text is historical and, you know, say a, it, sa it seems to say that um, you know, Cain built a city way after, well, I guess it depends on when you date, you know, Cain living and all that. But yeah. I mean, I would assume you don't say that, you know, Cain literally built the first city or, 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 or Cain, 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 son, Cain son, okay. but it's, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, it's complicated. There's a lot of ambiguity we can't be dogmatic about it um but um again this raises the issue of science and the bible um and um science has many many um many many arguments or lines of evidence that point to the fact that the cosmos is at least 14.3 billion years old and that the earth is four point something years old and that homo sapiens emerged about 300,000 years ago and that and and again it's not like it's a tenuous scientific argument it's a um strong multiple evidenced and long-term argument. And so um, to think that, uh, well, the first, the second or third generation of humanity built the first city is kind of problematic. However, um, I would say this, that, um, again, I may have mentioned this earlier. I don't think Genesis 1 and 2 is talking about the origins of Homo sapiens, but rather Genesis 1 and 2 is talking about the origin of what John Stott and Derek Kidner, important thinkers of the previous generation, called Homo divinus. Homo divinus, that is uh, the first Homo sapiens that are endowed with the status of being image bearers and therefore representing God in creation, morally innocent, etc. So um, when that happened is not clear. Some people think it happened, you know, maybe before the um, Neolithic revolution, say around 11,000 BC, and others might think it's later. But, but again, I don't <clears throat> think it's legitimate to read Genesis 1 to 11 as pointing to young earth creation. As you know, <clears throat> there are a number of people who <clears throat> in the popular press, um, 
you know, point, argue that the, the creation is only 6,000 years old or 10,000 years old. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> I recovered from COVID about three weeks ago, but I have a, if I talk too long, I, oh, I have. Wow. <laughs> um, so, um, <clears throat> so yeah, um, I, 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 I think that a young earth creationist perspective has numerous problems, not just with science, but with reading the Bible. They're using the genealogies of Genesis to reconstruct the time when uh, humanity emerged, but that genealogies <clears throat> in the Bible are not giving consecutive genetic, biological, um, and, ex, you know, uh, being exhaustive in talking about um, gen, uh, generations. <clears throat> in other words, the, um, in other words, um, people tend to read biblical genealogies as if they're modern genealogies and not ancient Near Eastern genealogies, of which we have a number of them. And ancient Near Eastern genealogies are not exclusively built on historical genetic relationships. I've written about this for people who are interested in the Dictionary of Christianity and Science which I also co-edited, and uh, I, I've written about it in the in the article on genealogy. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Everyone should go check that out. Um, so, a question for you: If the Noah's, if you know the story's Noah's flood is portrayed as you know hyperbolic, hyperbolic language for a, a global flood, but like you know, it's it's it was actually a local flood. Um, how does that make sense to say that God said that it, he wouldn't send a flood again? Yeah, um, I think what it's saying is that God is not going to completely destroy humanity until the end of time. Uh, or he's not going to destroy humanity at the end of time, but he's going to bring history to an end at the end of time. Um, so I think it's emphasizing the fact that there is stability to creation um, until God decides to um, intervene again and to have the final judgment. Uh, and indeed, in the New Testament, the flood story is used to talk about the final judgment, right? So in second peter and elsewhere so um <clears throat> yeah i think it's <clears throat> i think it's a way of communicating and, and genesis 9 talks about that um let me turn to genesis 9 real quickly Oh, it's actually at the end of Genesis 8. It says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. You know, it's kind of like, uh, I'm not going to periodically destroy humanity. Um, I think that's what the promise is. So would you say this is, again, figurative language? Um. No, or, I don't. It, yeah, <laughs> like, I guess technically it does say never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So not specifically that there's not going to be a flood, but it's never going to be a flood to destroy the earth. Yeah, yeah, I think. Um, I think again, what it's communicating is <clears throat> uh, that we're God is not. You know, the interesting thing is God. Uh, brought the flood because of human, the pervasive human sin, right? And, um, and, and there's still pervasive human sin. <laughs> uh, and so uh, 
on the level of justice, you might think that God could periodically just bring a flood or some kind of devastating judgment within the temporal horizon. But if you read Genesis 9 in the light of later biblical teaching, you understand that um, God is delaying his judgment until the second coming of Christ. And then there will be um, a judgment on humanity. The flood story is kind of like a preview of the final judgment. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so, um, so you know, many scholars have noted the incredible long list of parallels and contrasts of Adam and Noah, and then you know you have the creation mm-hmm. week and you know the whole yeah. the flood thing story going on, and all that stuff is going to be on the screen. Um, one in particular that I wanted to point out, you know, it says Genesis one, you know, God creates Ha Adam, you know humankind and then in genesis 6 it says he's going to destroy humankind so Mm -hmm. you know many have taken these these two passages that you know the writer or however that they know that occurred was trying or you know god was trying to say that because the text of genesis 6 is you know a global event that it the you know, Genesis 1 is also a global event. Of course, I think that you would agree that Genesis 1 is a global event, even though you think that, you know, it's very figurative in some way because, um, you know, it's it's all of humanity. But if it if Genesis 1 is all of humanity, then we have to say that Genesis 6 must be all of humanity because it's making that parallel, right? And if you don't say that, then wouldn't you have to say that Genesis 1 isn't all humanity because technically it is local or... How would you um, weed that out? Well, first of all, I would affirm what you're saying about the relationship between the creation story and the flood story. Uh, Scholars have pointed out that you have a one way of thinking about Genesis 1 to 9 is that it's the story of creation. And then what you have in the flood is an uncreation, a reversion on the level of the narrative. It's a reversion to uh, tohu wa bohu, right? Genesis 1, 2, formless and void, which is indicating basically an undifferentiated watery mass. And then there's a recreation in Genesis 9. So creation, uncreation, recreation. Um, But again, I think that, well, that it's um, a figurative depiction of an actual um, historical event. I mean, it's um, talking about the fact that sin leads to judgment. And like the other stories in Genesis 3 to 11, namely the story of Cain and Abel, the story of the flood and the story of the Tower of Babel, there's a very distinctive uh, literary slash theological pattern of accounts of sin followed by a judgment speech, then the execution of the judgment, but also a token of grace. So these stories are communicating that human beings are persistent sinners, that God will always judge sin. He won't let it pass, but it also, in the token of grace, shows that he's going to continue to pursue relationship with his sinful human creatures. Interesting. Okay. So, I mean, so you don't, you don't think that, you know, I mean, obviously you don't think so. Um, <laughs> do you, <laughs> you don't, so obviously you don't think that it, you know, it requires us to change our views on, um, you know, each path, but, but I mean, do you think that it's just simply is that, you know, that parallel just doesn't apply in regards to, 
you know, Genesis 1 is like some type of local event or, but, but it, it, even though it's displayed as a figurative, you know, yeah. worldwide well, I think, event for everyone or how does, you know, how does that work? Well, I think Genesis 1 and 2 is talking about a local event in a sense, uh, at, in terms of the history behind it. That is, it's not talking about the emergence of Homo sapiens uh, or the special creation of the Homo sapiens. It's talking about God's uh, endowment of certain Homo sapiens as being uh, endowed with his image, you know, that they will be his image bearers. Um, so, again, um, the historical reality behind Genesis 1 and 2 isn't, in my opinion, um, the creation or emergence from uh, previous primate past, according to the um, theory of evolution of Homo sapiens back in 300,000 BC, but rather uh, the choice and endowment of either a representative couple or a group uh that's the reality that stands behind the historical atom so i do affirm a historical atom but not your father's historical atom <laughs> awesome awesome okay okay so we're about out of time here. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to ask, you know, but doesn't that mean we're not made in the image of God or something like that? We are made uh, in the image of God. But, and you can talk about that in one minute, sure. Yeah, I can. So the image of God is a status. It's not a particular attribute. Uh, the status is that we are God's representatives. We reflect the glory of God in the world like the moon reflects the light of the sun. Uh, and that status comes with the commission to rule and subdue the earth as a benevolent ruler, just like God is king and he's a benevolent ruler of his creation. So we are to be his agents in creation. Awesome. Very quick response. Good job. Everyone make sure to check out uh, my interview with Carmen Joy Imes where we talked about that topic. Um, oh, yeah. She's great. She's great. Yeah. For sure. um, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Trimper Longman the third. this has been an awesome opportunity um, with your uh, one or two minutes left. Um, any places you want to um, link people towards uh, more of your content or... Um, or well, thanks, thanks, Zach. Yeah. Well, thanks, Zach. And first of all, thank you for this interview and the opportunity to talk to you. It's nice to get to know you. And... Um, Secondly, just go to Amazon.com and <laughs> put my name in there. You'll, I've written about 35 plus books, so a car co authored, so on various topics that you might be interested in. I'm sure so, someone can find at least one book that <laughs> apply to them. Um, but yeah, this has been awesome. I really thank you so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your night, Dr. Wonder. You too, Zach. Thank you. Thank you.